Shania Watson, and I'd like to welcome you to A Taste of Blue Hills. Before we begin, I want to let you know a little about our school. Blue Hills Regional Technical School is a public high school located in Canton, Massachusetts with over 800 students who live in the nine surrounding towns. In addition to a high school diploma, students graduate with a trade license or certificate and are well prepared for immediate employment. There are 17 different programs a student can choose at Blue Hills. And this show is a joint effort between both the culinary arts and the design and visual communications programs. Students get to learn both in front of the camera and behind the scenes. In this series of programs, we are introducing students like me to careers in video and television production in the culinary industry. We hope you enjoy it. In this episode of A Taste of Blue Hills, we are going to show you some tips, techniques, and interesting info that we have learned over our last four years. For this next segment, I'm going to treat you to a lesson from my Louisiana roots. My family is originally from there, and our kitchen is always filled with wonderful flavors of Southern cuisine. By sharing my family with yours, I hope to introduce you to one of our most traditional dishes, gumbo. Hi again, I'm Shania Watson, and I am a senior at Blue Hills, and I'm going to attend the University of Notre Dame to start my journey of becoming a veterinarian. You may be wondering then why I am in the Culinary Arts Vocational Program given my plans for the future, or why I'm even speaking to you at this time. Well, during my years here, this program has taught me a lot about the industry of cooking, giving me a deeper understanding of what it means to cook, igniting a passion for food within my life. Through this newfound passion, I have been able to explore the rich cultural foods of my own background. My grandmother was born in Louisiana and my grandfather in Georgia, so I have become very familiar with Southern dishes. One of my favorite traditional Louisiana dishes is none other than gumbo. Gumbo is an aromatic soup stew characteristic of Creole cuisine of Louisiana, combining African, American, Indian, and European elements. Now, before I can really get into what gumbo is, I would have to explain its history. You can learn a lot about the history of Southern food by studying a bowl of gumbo. The very name conjures up a rich array of ingredients coming together in a single pot and melding into something rich and delicious. It represents the intersection of three cultures, European, Native American, and West African. That created what we know today as Southern cuisine. The roots of gumbo do run deep in Louisiana. Enslaved Africans were brought to the French colony in large numbers starting in 1719, and by 1721, more than half of the residents of Louisiana, of New Orleans, were African. The first known reference of gumbo as a dish was un covered by historian Gwendolyn Midlow Hall, who found a handwritten transcription of the interrogation of a 50-year-old slave named Kumba in New Orleans in 1764. Suspected of being associated with other slaves who had stolen clothes and a pig, Kumba is asked whether she had given the slave named Louis Gumbo, and she replies that she did. Although it is hard to track, its specific creation. Since then, gumbo has evolved and crossed all class barriers, appearing on the tables of the poor as well as the wealthy. Although ingredients may vary greatly from one cook to the next and from one part of the state to another, a steaming bowl of fragrant gumbo is one of life's cherished pleasures and emblematic of Louisiana. The ingredients of gumbo include, but certainly not, are not limit, limited to, leftover cooked chicken that you boil down in water to essentially create the broth. You can, use just, you can just use chicken broth, but this method truly makes the chicken that more tender and allows every bit of that flavor to be absorbed into your gumbo. You can also do this with turkey, which is a tradition in my family after Thanksgiving when there's a lot of leftover turkey to use. Then you would add your smoked sausage and frozen okra. Fresh okra doesn't cook as well when making gumbo in a big medley pot, but if that is all you have, then it still brings the essential flavor that is necessary to make gumbo what it is. Of course, this wouldn't be a southern dish without seasonings and spices, so you have to make sure to throw in some salt, pepper, garlic powder, onion powder, and nowadays they even sell gumbo seasoning to really add that boost of, flavor, boost of traditional gumbo flavor. Lastly, you need to add shrimp. Shrimp cooks really quickly, so it's important not to add it in too soon. You could also substitute this for crawfish, which is very traditional in Louisiana culture, especially in the seafood medley version of gumbo. And finally, my personal favorite way of serving gumbo and eating gumbo is over a nice heaping pile of white rice. Gumbo has withstood the test of time for my family and many, and I hope that by sharing this with you, 
all, you can see why this dish is so important to me and my community, as well as how my time at Blue Hills has brought me closer to my family and my identity. time-saving and easy tips and tricks to make your culinary life much easier. While she could spend an entire episode on this subject, she picked out a few that we think you'll use all the time. Hello everyone, my name is Naya. I am a senior at Blue Hills and I will be attending Johnson & Wales University in the fall. Today I will be showing you some food and kitchen hacks to make life a little bit easier. But today mainly what I'm going to be focusing on is breakfast. So like say you're in a rush to either get out the door, or maybe you have to go get the kids ready, or maybe you're late for work and you just want something very quick and easy to do, you can always boil an egg. Um, so what I have here is about five to six cups of water. I don't need a lot of water just to make sure it's enough to cover the eggs. So as long as it's enough water to cover the eggs, you'll be fine, okay? So first thing you wanna do, for this amount of water in this pot that I have, I have some salt here, and I'm gonna use about a tablespoon to a tablespoon and a half of salt into the water. You just wanna make sure it's enough so it tastes like seawater. So, this is, that's a tablespoon, yeah, I think I'm gonna do a half as well. So once you get that going, you want to put this on the stove and get it nice and hot. And once it starts boiling, you should see the, the salt starting to dissolve. Give it a quick stir. You're going to put your eggs in the water very carefully because it will be hot. And you want to put it in there for about anywhere between 7 and roughly 13 minutes, depending on how you like your boiled eggs. If you want a hard boiled egg, I would say anywhere between 10 minutes and up. Adding the salt to the water helps it solidify the proteins within the egg. Um, this helps it crack easier, you know, peel it easier, and ultimately it just makes a better, harder egg. So now that the eggs are done boiling, you want to either rinse it off with some cool water, or you can just wait until the eggs in the water temperature goes down and, you know, cools down so you don't burn yourself. Um, I prefer to wear gloves with any type of food that I make because any ready to eat food, you don't know what type of bacteria is on your hand and you don't want it to get into your food. This is not fun. <laughs> so what you want to do to crack this egg, you can a firm press on a flat surface and rotate, being sure to crack all of the shell and it should be able to peel right off. So I have a few shells, so you can just rinse that off. You have a nice hard bowl of egg. Um, it always is easier to find an extra bowl to put your garbage in. So whatever garbage you have while you're cooking, you can always put it in this little bowl, and whenever you're done, you can always dispose of it quick and easy. Say you don't want a hard boiled egg, or maybe you just want an alternative. You can also fry an egg, and an easier way to do that is to use a mason jar lid, surprisingly. So, I have my pan here, and I have an egg, my mason jar lid, some type of spray. You can use butter, oil, or a spray, and I just have tongs because it's easier to pick up with the mason jar when it's ready to flip. First things first, turn on your fire. You don't want it too high heat. You don't want your egg to burn or anything. It's a good spray. So it wasn't anything too crazy. You don't have to put a lot. And you also want to give your mason jar lid a good spray. Just to make sure nothing sticks. Now we're going to be using the inside. So it's not going to be this way. We're going to be using the inside here. You just want to pop that right in the lid, right in the pan. Now I'm seeing the pan get hot. The oil is starting to bubble a little bit. So taking our egg here. Quick little tap and right in. This is where the garbage bowl comes in handy and we can always dispose of our trash. Now, this is just going to sit here and it's going to cook for a while. 
Um, however, you can always, you know, add whatever you want to this, or you can do really whatever you feel is good for you. So you just want to make sure you're paying attention to your fire, that it's not too high. Once the egg whites start to solidify a little bit, you can then turn it with your tongs. I recommend tongs because it's easier to pick up rather than a spatula where you have to flip it over and everything can potentially fall out. So when it comes to flipping your egg, I'm going to show you what it looks like now. The whites are now pretty solidified. You want to be very careful. You can always move your egg around. Sometimes your oil will start turning color or your butter depending on what type of substitute you use. So that just means your fire is too high. You just want to pick it up, flip it over, give it a loose little shake, and the rest of the uncooked egg is now going to fall to the bottom, which is then going to cook it thoroughly. The next little hack I have here, this is like a very quick little thing. Say you want to, no matter what you're doing, if you don't like backlash off of oil so much and you're too afraid to come this far to crack an egg, you can always do it right in a bowl and use a water bottle to separate. So you would crack into a separate bowl. So you're going to slightly squeeze your bottle and put it right over the yolk so that it can go right in the bowl. Separate. So for the next little hack I have is using foil and you fold it up as like an accordion and you would lay it on your sheet which would then create a crisper bacon because the oil would then fall into the seams and circulate the air more. So what I have here is some heavy duty foil. Let's take a piece. to fold it up like an accordion. I'm going about maybe half an inch thick. And it's just like how it's maybe, you know, you in like school or something when you were little, making a little accordion. It's just back and forth, you want to fold. So what you would do is 
lay them out on the board. I'm going to put the lid on top. Give it a firm press. Don't squash them. Give it a firm press. Lay your hand flat and make sure your knife is sharp. And you just want to slowly glide all the way across. And now you have half tools. You know how they say when life gives you lemons, make lemonade? Well, if you microwave your lemon, depending on the size, between 10 to 20 minutes, you can actually roll it on a flat surface to release all its juices easier so that when you're ready to cut, it is easier and juicier. Say you don't want to squeeze it with your hand, you can always grab a pair of tongs and it can also be juiced that way. Bananas tend to ripen very quickly, as you can see. Um, some ripen more than others. A quick little hack for this is to actually take some plastic wrap and wrap the top part of the bananas with the plastic wrap. So, for an example, you, just, you don't need this much. Just a little piece. You just wrap it right where the stem is, right at the top. Usually it comes in a bundle, and it'll be totally fine to wrap the whole thing at once. So you just want to put it right on the top where the stems are. You may see these in grocery stores where bananas are already in a bunch with plastic wrap on top. And that is because bananas contain ethylene gas, which bananas produce naturally, but it will speed up the ripening process. So just covering this is a quick and easy tip to keep your bananas nice and fresh. My name is Naya, and I hope you guys enjoyed all these hacks that I did today, and have a great day. And to wrap up our show like I did, Marissa is going to show us a bit about her heritage and walk us through one of her most loved Mexican family recipes, showing how easy it is to make your own authentic refried beans. Hi, my name is Marissa Baum. I'm a senior at, at Blue Hills. I'm in the culinary program and I'm going to go to Massasoit come the fall or spring. So I'm making refried beans for you guys today. For time purposes, I have canned beans, which are right here. Now normally I would boil them with cilantro, a little bit of salt. Fortunately, for time purposes, we don't have that today. So I'm going to use canned beans. You can use basically any type of bean, navy, pinto, what's the other one called? Kidney beans, black beans, which I'm using today. What you have to keep in mind though is that kidney beans, pinto beans are sweeter and Black beans have a more savory flavor, so you do have to keep that in mind when you're treating the beans and season accordingly. Now, I like to season mine with bell pepper, which is right here. I'm going to use a food processor to blend all of mine up. So that includes all the beans, all, all this. I'm going to add some cilantro there because I didn't get to add it when the beans are boiling. And I'm going to mince some onions put in there and put in the oil later. So make sure you have make sure you have a little bit of onion left over to mince into smaller bits so you can actually refry the meat instead of just heating the little oil. So you're going to cut them into chunk sized pieces because they're going to be grinded together anyway. You're going to throw them in there, you're going to wait. You're going to wait for this, this, and this until you have everything chopped up and in there before you start to see the little bit of black beans to do it. It just makes it go a lot smoother if everything's in there at once. If you can't put everything in there at once, put one bit of beans when you're first blending it and then put the rest and add it in. But you need to have some of the vegetables blended with some portion of the beans to get the flavor feel. of cilantro and then mince some onion. Now these onions are going to be used for later when you're actually refrying the beans with oil, which I have here, and I have a pot with a heater over here. big pot for later you're going to need oil of your choice if you use vegetable oil. In the past people used lard. 
Now these beans personally, since I'm a third generation Mexican, I have learned them from my family. These, this recipe specifically, I don't know if it originated in Mexico, but eventually Mexico, Mexico picked it up, which is where I learned it. Obviously there are a lot of other cultures that have beans, and if you want to do a more ethnic style, I encourage you to do a little bit more research so you can stay true to the original style, and you can actually say did authentic beans. Now these are not difficult at all. So you can literally do it whenever you want. It's a quick recipe in regards to preparation time. You literally just blend it all together and then reheat it. That's going to take about an hour to two hours, depending on how thick you want them. You want to leave them a little bit thinner than how you actually want them, just so that you can adjust it later. When you reheat it, it'll reduce more. So you want a little bit more watery, a little bit more liquidy, so that when you do reheat it for actual use, it's going to be your desired consistency instead of too, too thick to actually use. I'm going to pour a little bit of water in here, and I'm going to put the beans in here. I'm not too worried about the water coming in right now, because I have more beans that I can add in, and I can strain those if this looks a little bit too thin or a little bit too thick. Since I'm not going to have a lot of time here today, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger than I usually would, but ideally you do want most of the liquid in there, and then you just take more time to reduce it down. Yes. So I'm going to puree these beans. Make sure your food processor is all safe to go. If it has any safety features, make sure that those are engaged because you do not want to get hurt. You don't want these flying around. If you have a blender, you can use that too, anything to get it smooth. If you're using powdered spices, you can definitely use that. That's nice and easy. However, you don't need to put it in a food processor. I'm only doing mine in a food processor because I have because I have peppers, I have onions, I have cilantro that always get blended in there together. If you're using powdered ones, you can literally just put it in the pot and then mush it with a fork or a potato masher or anything you have, really. Wait 
there won't, they won't even be there essentially, just for the flavor. So if you have picky children, don't worry, they're definitely not going to see the onions. Now this works as a side dish, as a bean dip, as basically anything you want it to be. This is a something you could very well move into even a dessert. My mom does makes a dessert out of pinto beans since they are sweeter. How long does it keep? That's a real question here. So usually you want to keep them for about a week to two weeks. That's the norm for cooked vegetables or cooked foods in general. You should not keep things more than a week. If you want to put it in the freezer, you can only put it in a freezer back one in the freezer that would last two weeks, but this is gone within days that I have, so I really can't advocate for that. And that's because the onions are nice and caramelized, and since I don't really care about seeing the onions that much, I'm just going to add everything right in. I'm going to add in all the beets. If it looks a little bit weird, don't worry, it's always going to look a little bit weird when you mix it in, when you mix the two batches together. Things will look more normal and just trust your gut with this. This is really about what you think, how much oil do you think you need, how much pepper you think you need, how much, depending on your diet, depending on what you usually eat, depending on what you're putting it on the side with, if you have something really salty, you're probably not going to want to put a lot of salt. I'm going to put these to the side and I don't know how much salt was put in these beans originally since these are canned beans, so I'm just going to sprinkle a little bit of salt on there because I like mine salty as it's a dip instead of a side dish today. You're going to want to constantly stir every few minutes if it's on a stove. during every few minutes just until it gets thick enough and colored enough where you can pick it up and it flows for dip I'd say like lava off your spoon. It'll start to bubble, it'll start to boil, that is perfectly normal, that is perfectly okay. In regards to how high the heat should be, if you want them to cook quicker, which normally I don't recommend because refried beans are really like a slow process. It's something you do when you're working from home, maybe. When you're at work and you're at a meeting, you put this on before the meeting, and then once the meeting is done, you have a nice bean dip. You just hop out every few minutes and then come back in. No one will know anything is happening. Since I'm doing it in a few minutes, you're gonna, I'm keeping it kind of high just so I can show you what the desired result will look like. But if you want a better result than even this one, and I know that most of you do, you're gonna want to put it onto a kind of medium to low heat. If you're putting it at a higher heat, you want to make sure to stir more consistently. So if this is a kind of dinner thing, you're waiting for the rice to cook and you're waiting for the meat to cook, you can keep it at a higher temperature and just keep stirring. That's perfectly okay. It really depends on your cooking style, how many people you have at the house. The best thing about this is it doesn't really have a serving size, technically. You can eat however much you want. It's really healthy. It, there isn't a lot of preservatives in here. There isn't a lot of sugar in here. This is a nice, healthy bean dip that's not going to have a lot of fat. That's not going to have a lot of added in stuff because you're making it from home. Now that it's a little bit more thickened, you can see it's flowing like lava down the spoon. That's only because it's hot. Once it's cooled down, it's going to be a little bit cooler. I'm going to put it in a little plate. You can put it in a bowl. You can put it in basically anything. But that's how it looks unstrained. That's how it looks unstrained. The color is nice. Obviously, I could have cured it a little bit longer. I could have done a lot of different things to make it look more smooth, a lot of different things to make it more thick, a lot of different things to make it thinner. But hopefully, I've explained the steps well enough to you for you to be able to make a decision on your own. So,
Javire. Thanks for watching A Taste of Blue Hills. We hope you found some tips and tricks to make your cooking experience a little bit easier. To rewatch this or any other shows, find us on Facebook or YouTube under the Blue Hills Culinary BBC. You can also follow our Facebook page for more information on the happenings of Blue Hills. Thanks again, and stay safe!